welcome everyone to the Glencoe Library in real life. <laughs> um, it's nice to have you here. Um, um, so this program coordinates with the launch of the library's seed library. And that will be this Saturday on March 16th. And it encourages the beautiful, enjoyable, and healthy hobby of gardening by offering free seed packets for permanent checkout. Patrons take the home the seeds home to plant and grow them into herbs, veggies, and flowers. We don't have all the herbs, veggies, and flowers, but we have some, um, and you can get a good start with them. And so people are encouraged to harvest the seeds from the plants that they grow from the seeds they got here and dry them and return them to the library for use next year, but it's not mandatory. It can be a permanent checkout and that's that. Okay. Anyway, um, I have brochures about the seed library if you'd like more information. You can also stop by between 10 and 12 on Saturday morning at the launch and some of our staffers will be there wearing sunflower glasses <laughs> and, and giving out seeds. So anyway, that's we're having a lot of fun with that. Now, I'd like to introduce our presenter tonight, Jeannie Nolan, one of the first people I ever met when I moved to Glencoe. Thank you. Uh-huh. I know. Our kids in second grade. Yeah, we go way back. <laughs> uh, Jeannie's been growing food organically for over 35 years. She's a well-known educator and consultant and the founder of The Organic Gardener Limited. She's a Winneka native, and she spent 17 years learning to farm in Texas, North Carolina, and California. In 2005, Jeannie began working with Chicago's Green City Market. On their behalf, she designed, installed, and now maintains the Edible Gardens, which is a 5,000 square foot educational children's garden at Lincoln Park Zoo's Farm in the Zoo. That same year, Jeannie launched The Organic Gardener, rooted in her belief that everyone everywhere can benefit from growing their own food, like you guys. Um, Jeannie also regularly teaches about growing food on WTTW's Chicago Tonight, Chicago Tribune, Food and Wine, Woman's Day, and other national publications. In 2013, Random House published her book, From the Ground Up. You can see some copies over there, and it's also in the library's collection. And Random House um, called it one of the most, sorry, the New York Times called it one of the most intelligent, surprising, and impressive garden memoirs. Jeannie lives with her husband on a little farm in Norfolk. So I'm going to hand it over to Jeannie. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Very happy. Uh, we lived in Glencoe for nine years and our kids benefited from everything that all of us benefit from in this amazing community. Um, so tonight, yeah, I'll speak maybe 40 minutes or so, and we'll have plenty of time for questions. And it's a big topic, how to succeed at growing food. So there's a lot I'm not going to cover. So when we get into questions, we can talk specifics, tomato varieties, whatever, whatever's on your mind. Um, okay, so uh, Grace mentioned my book, and the, the only reason I want to circle back to it is the appendix is 10 lists of 10, and it's um, intended to be very user-friendly for someone who's starting their garden. Um, so... Uh, it was a fun project to do. Now we're working on some potential film versions of it. <laughs> Nothing online yet, just in the early stages. But um, so the Organic Gardener is our um, company. We're based in Northbrook. And I wanted to let everyone know that we um, design, built, and work with all three of the Glencoe schools. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Southwest and Central School each of them has an edible garden um, that we designed with them. Uh, the first one was at South School. It's in the courtyard, which is fantastic. Um, and we just met um, with the amazing Catherine Wang. Many of you know her, our incredible superintendent here, um, because the garden at Central School has to be torn down because they're uh, expanding the building. But it's a great opportunity we have a potential new site for a larger garden. And, you know, for that middle school age, getting physical, growing food, so great. Um, and of course, we have the amazing Glencoe Community Garden. 
that, of course, we talked about partnering in some way when we stood on the land at Central. <laughs> so school gardens. And, and what, what I love about uh, doing school gardens, our company, uh, The Organic Gardener, we, we operate close to 25 school gardens all over Chicagoland. But it gives children that much needed experiential learning learning by doing, learning, learning through our hands. Some of us learn better that way. <laughs> so, you know, a chance during a school day to physically engage in learning something um, can be so impactful. Um, I had intended to tell you a little bit more about our company, The Organic Gardener. I don't want to skip over that so that you're clear on, on what I do. My husband and I uh, run a business. We have about 25 employees, about 10 minutes from here is where we're based. And we operate around 220 vegetable gardens annually. We usually build around 40 new gardens for people. Um, pre predominantly about 70% of what we do is residential. So we work with families, you know, grandparents who say, I want to put a garden in my backyard. So when the grandkids come over, you know, I can share this passion with them. Um, we work in urban situations on rooftops um, with all ages. Everybody on our team is a garden educator. So uh, we really are into teaching. And this is a mission and a movement that we are part of. Um, and then we also do, um, Grace mentioned the garden in Lincoln Park Zoo. We do a lot of uh, nonprofits, corporate gardens in uh, Northbrook. We have a wonderful garden at the Village Hall, a community garden in Riverwoods. We have the same where um, we're educating people. So uh, we offer tours, both of our home farm, 10 minutes from here. We have a couple of goats and a lot of animals and we're on the middle uh, the North Branch, Middle Fork Branch of the North Branch of the Chicago River. So that's a really neat ecosystem on our land. And then at our headquarters, we have a demonstration garden and a greenhouse and uh, lots of ways to learn and connect. Uh, oh, and I wanted to mention this project because this um, was created in partnership with the Glencoe Union Church. Uh, and this is at... Um, a, a shelter, homeless shelter for young men in the city. Um, and it's just a fantastic project that um, has been going a long time. Uh, so, okay, let's get down to business here. Um, so uh, the way I'm gonna structure this today is first we're gonna start with assuming maybe you don't have a garden and you're considering it. So our first stage is gonna be the five keys to designing or planning your garden, okay? Then we're gonna move more into a little bit of talking about planting and maintaining, but starting with design. Oh, and this is our previous garden, which we shared. Uh, this is on Maple Hill Road in Glencoe. We lived for nine years in a beautiful coach house, uh, David Adler coach house on Maple Hill, and this was the garden. And we just had so much fun planting and tending that. It was a big space. Um, I see a, a potted lemon tree. Oh boy, we grew a lot of food here. <laughs> um, okay, so the first key to success is sun. And this is really important because if you think about a farm, farms have full sun. There aren't trees planted in front of, in the middle of farm fields. So food grows best on the right. You can see, let's see, yeah, a full sun garden. Um, we're getting eight plus hours of sun a day. That enables you really to grow anything you want. Big tomatoes, peppers that ripen to color, red, yellow, orange, um, corn, things like that. Now the figure eight garden <laughs> uh, was a wonderful uh, friend uh, in Evanston who had a very shady yard. And we took the sunniest spot and made a garden, but it really only got four to seven hours of sun a day. So in that case, we were able to grow food, but only little cherry tomatoes or green little jalapeno peppers. 
So uh, it's important to know your son. We work with a tool that we bring whenever we meet with someone who wants a garden that lets us know how much sun the site gets. You can track it yourself, but it's a really important key to success. In the early years of our business in 2005, I, I let a homeowner in Kenilworth convince me that they had enough sun. I'd done a beautiful garden for their neighbor and they really didn't have enough sun, but I was too shy to tell this, you know, very powerful, attractive man, you know, saying, oh, we got tons of sun. I have to water this constantly. And then nothing grew. <laughs> so I don't do that anymore. Now I say, no, I won't do it. <laughs> but I had to learn. <laughs> so look for a good sunny spot. The second key to success has to do with the soil. Uh, really, the soil is like the immune system of the plants. It's really going to determine um, the disease resistance, the flavor, um, the overall, the, the pest resistance, the resistance of the plants to insects that are a problem. It's all determined by the soil. And the two factors that you want to have in the soil are a lot of air. You want the soil light and fluffy. We often overlook how important that is. And a lot of nutrients. Nutrients are added annually. The plants sort of almost like babies that breastfeed and take nutrients from the mom. The plants are feeding on the soil. So annually, you have to add back in. Uh, this is our team on the right a, a few years ago. Uh, that's our home garden in Northbrook, where we, we brought in truckloads of compost because we had to raise it. Uh, and the reason that I'm showing the other slide with the picket fence um, is to demonstrate that there's more than meets the eye. What we're going for is 18 inches of well-aerated, nutrient-dense soil. So where the soil is mounded in the rows, maybe 8 to 12 inches above ground, we've also worked below ground. So that is very important. Um, a couple of other slides here. Composting, this young friend of mine in our garden in Lincoln Park Zoo, adding plant waste to the compost unit. Uh, next to it is a potato grow bag. And below the container, those two containers are intended to show that uh, if you're going to grow food in a container, you just have to buy a very high quality potting soil that has a lot of nutrients in it. So the same principle holds if you're in a container. And the tool is one of our favorites called a broad fork, two-handled tool, excellent for aerating the soil. The third key to success is clearly defined walking paths. Um, let's see. The stone garden, the stone raised beds, that's over in Winneka at Indian Hill Country Club. They have a garden. Um, we, we were at quite a few country clubs. Skokie Country Club had a big garden with us for many years. But um, these two slides are intended to show the walking path. So you're not walking on your soil. So your soil is keeping the air it needs in it. And um, it, the beds are elevated. Uh, walking exerts up to 10 pounds of pressure per square inch of earth. So clearly defined walking paths, usually two to three feet wide, sometimes narrower, um, you know, are very, very helpful, especially when you're gardening with children, really helps. Fourth key to success, irrigation. So rare is the human being that enjoys watering their garden. I have met a few people who really like that quiet time, but um, I would say 98% of the time we're installing an automatic water system. It can be, if you have an irrigation system on your property, it can be keyed into that, or we often do a battery operated standalone timer, but it, you can do this yourself. You can buy a kit for it. It's a method of irrigating that was originally developed by the Israelis, who we know were in a very dry situation and needed to find the most efficient way to deliver water right to the plants. 
And so that is through what's called drip line irrigation. It's tubes that have a hole about every foot and just a little water drips out. Uh, and this works very well, um, you know, it, it, in, in tall raised beds or, uh, you know, uh, any kind of system. But, um, you know, there are years when we don't need to water a lot, but there are other years where, you know, if you're not watering, you're not really going to have a garden. So it's a good uh, key to success. And the fifth key to success is fencing. So, uh, uh, you know, Around here, our, most of the time we're dealing with rabbits uh, and, you know, chicken wire is sort of the most common thing. We tend to work with a little prettier version of that, a square mesh, um, and, and it can become sort of galvanized or black or galvanized wire. But when we first started our business, I had no idea we'd have a fencing company, but we do. And thankfully my husband is, is good at all of that. Uh, so we, we team up on designing uh, really beautiful fences because the fence is what you see all year. Um, so, and sometimes we're dealing with deer. Uh, depending on the level of deer pressure, this is quote deer proof. It's a garden in Lake Forest, but it's by the driveway. They, they don't see a lot of deer. So we're about four and a half feet tall there, but we often are eight feet tall. In Michigan, we do a lot of gardens where there's heavy deer pressure. So it just depends on the situation. Uh, this is another Glencoe garden. Um, and I, I think since it's been actually redone and is even prettier, uh, but, um, you know, looking to uh, just because it, it needs a fence and rabbit proof, we try to make them cute and customized. Um, so two essential styles of gardening. This is an in-ground garden. It's in Winnetka. It's one of my favorites because it's a front yard garden. And people always say, oh, you know, do you get in trouble? No, if you make your front yard garden pretty, it's contagious. All the neighbors come over and they want tomatoes and they then they want their own garden. Um, but this is an in-ground garden, meaning it's not raised beds. We did not bring in timbers. Uh, this site had a couple of pluses that uh, made doing it in ground make sense. It drains well. It's kind of on a high point of this property. Um, and the soil um, is the native soil, good soil. Sometimes if you get too close to a house, you can have sort of construction debris. It can be compacted. If you're... Yeah, clay soil, or if it's next to a house, uh, we had this when we lived in Evanston, there was a very high lead count in the soil because the house was built so long ago, it had been painted with lead paint. So, uh, but when we can do an in-ground garden, it's a fantastic way to grow. The paths are wood chips in this. Um, but of course, we build a lot of raised beds. On the right, uh, this is a garden in the city, raised beds with gravel paths. Um, and French intensive gardening is the method that we're trying to do whenever we can. Uh, and this was developed um, in France, of course, where they were using a lot of composted horse manure in really deep, deep beds to grow food just outside of Paris. And they grew an enormous amount of food and what they found was that when you have so much nutrients in the soil, you can plant and put the plants very close together and that keeps your weeds down and also keeps moisture in. So the raised beds lend themselves really well to this uh, French intensive method. This is just another set of raised beds. This was a front yard garden in Evanston and they weren't allowed to put in a fence. So uh, thankfully, the homeowner was like, I like really tall raised beds. <laughs> and it's hard to see, but on either side, there is a lower raised bed that has a little removable fence, which is where we did the tomatoes. Because these beds are three feet tall. If you put a tomato on top of there, you need a tall ladder. So we, we built some smaller, um, subtle beds for the tomatoes, but all kinds of shapes and sizes. Okay, so... Let's talk now about planting. 
Uh, and many people think that um, when you're planting your garden, you know, maybe a little bit after Mother's Day, you're just going to plant it once and that's it. Um, well, the truth is that planting comes in waves and you can really plant all season, um, you know, through early September. So we've already started planting because you can tell that the weather is unique, very warm. Um, but the first wave of planting are the cold tolerant spring crops. So, uh, you know, this is sort of what we start craving, spinach, peas, lettuce, broccoli, radishes, scallions. Um, and these crops really in the form of seeds can go in now. Uh, in the form of plants, we like to wait a little longer. We'll start putting plants in the ground mid-April. Uh, and these cold tolerant crops can be put in the ground through May. Then as it warms up and really gets cooking, which the past few years, we've begun to do this second wave of plants, the heat loving summer crops later than we used to. Um, because we were having such erratic, uh, unpredictable uh, weather in that spring to summer transition. So where we used to start putting tomatoes in May 15th, we really are pushing it to the end of May, if not the beginning of June. Basil, tomatoes, eggplant. What happens is if a plant experiences too much stress through temperature or water fluctuations, it, it inhibits its strength. Like us, we don't do well when we have too much stress. So um, those heat loving crops, tomatoes, basils, pepper, cucumber, eggplant, you know, end of May, but honestly, first week of June is just fine too. Um, hurrying to get a tomato into the ground earlier does not necessarily mean that it will be larger or fruit earlier. Often, I'm, you know, if you put it in the ground June 10th, it'll do great. And we've also started doing more uh, in this third wave of planting. Well, actually, Actually, though, that those first 10 days of July, we've even started putting in a second wave of summer crops, tomatoes and basil, and that's been going really well. Uh, fall crops, it's the most challenging. It's hard to get them to germinate out in the garden, but uh, you can do plantings July through September and, and do quite well. And then the crops that we plant at the end of the season are garlic, especially, and sometimes spinach. Um, sit in the soil over winter and then pop up. Garlic is about this big now and we'll harvest that um, in, in July and that was planted at the end of November. So that's how the timing goes. Um, and you know, we're, I've got this old, it's a dish towel with an old saying on it, you know, plant a thimble full of lettuce and spinach every two weeks or something like that. And, and it's true, you know, certain crops, cilantro, um, you know, you can just seed a little bit every couple of weeks and it just keeps coming for you. Um, so, so plant frequently is advice. Um, the second bullet point, direct seeding versus transplanting. So there are two ways to plant. You can poke seeds directly into the earth, or you can buy a plant or grow your own plants at home. So this is a list and you don't have to write this all down. I've, I've got a little stack of my cards. And if anybody, you know, I can email you this chart. Um, but anything with an asterisk on this chart can be planted either way. So a cucumber does equally well by poking the seed into the earth or by starting with a plant. Um, sometimes we find that in the instance of cucumbers, uh, little critters might eat the seed in the ground and it may not come up. So then we'll, we'll start with a plant. But a lot of things, you can just buy a packet of seeds and do quite well. But some things you really need that head start of a plant that was grown 
in warmer weather. So we have at our greenhouse in Northbrook, at our headquarters, we it's now tons of onions, parsley, and now we're starting to see the tomatoes, the eggplant, the peppers, um, flowers, and you know, they'll be growing two plus months in a greenhouse. Uh, we will bring them outside to quote, harden them off and get them used to, you know, the temperatures outside of the greenhouse, but you, you do have to start some things as transplants. Uh, I'm a huge fan of incorporating flowers in the garden. I'm, I'm grateful that um, the master gardeners who taught me um, and I learned, let's see, in Southern California, right on the Mexican border, outside uh, in Austin, Texas, and in Asheville, North Carolina are the three places that I farmed over 17 years. And the, the women who taught me were very into flowers. It was an edible garden for sure. It was a farm, but, you know, uh, every row was end capped by pretty flowers, um, lots of sunflowers. Uh, and and the whole process of selecting what flowers to grow, of course, it was beauty, <laughs> but it also has to do with the health of the garden. Um, so, you know, flowers help to create the harmonious environment that we want. In an organic garden where we're foregoing the use of herbicides to kill weeds, pesticides to kill bugs, or synthetic fertilizer, we're going all natural, we're looking to create harmony with nature and that does include insects. So what we want to do is attract beneficial insects. These are the bugs that prey on the pest insects. Uh, we want to attract pollinators, of course. Uh, we want to please ourselves and be happy when we're in a garden <laughs> and the flowers help with that. Um, uh, and when we work with families at the Organic Gardener, we have a, like a five page crop list where people make their selections and it goes as far as, you know, are there, are there any flowers you don't like or uh, what's your color scheme? You know, there, there's a lot to fine tune. That's a lot of fun. Um, and so cut flowers are, are a big part of, of a vegetable garden. Um, I, I have a friend who's a Dr. Gita Maker Clark. And uh, a few years ago, she invited me to speak at a food is medicine conference um, at North Shore. Oh, yeah, that's right. We also do a few gardens, uh, food is medicine gardens. At how we have one in Highland Park Hospital, one at Glenbrook Hospital. So that's been a really fun project. And those are gardens where the employees of the hospital get to harvest. Some of the doctors will sort of teach their patients about growing food. And I, I, I love sort of learning and preparation for this conference. You know, what does that really mean food as medicine? So this is the design of the garden at Glenbrook Hospital. Um, but you know, these bullet points here, you can kind of peruse them yourself. But we love Michael Pollan's quote mm -hmm. on the bottom, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, but this time of year, I'm certainly chomping at the bit. The vegetables in the grocery store are tasting worse and worse as we get closer to having our own. Uh, I do recommend um, if you eat at Prairie Grass Cafe, Chef Sarah Stegner is a good friend of mine in Northbrook. She is one of the founders of Green City Market, and her restaurant is very, very focused uh, mm -hmm. on being farmer friendly. Um, she just hosted a farm to table lunch there that, you know, there was fresh spinach just harvested, uh, beautiful winter radishes that a local farmer had stored over winter, shaved into the salad. She's really dedicated to that, and it's 10 minutes from here. So mm -hmm. food is medicine. Uh, this this is this is a picture long ago. These these two boys have grown up. This is a family in Northfield. We've all got sort of gross out looks on our face because we are hand picking Japanese beetles oh. off the garden, and we're putting dropping them into a little container of soapy water to die. Uh, 
but we're having fun. Mm -hmm. uh, and th this is a wonderful family. They have seven children and they were determined that all of their kids know how to grow food right near here in Northfield. And so I, we built the garden with them. It was one of my first projects in 2005. And then we, we would sort of plant with them. And then these kids tended their own garden and they, they really learned. Um, and it's been great fun. This is, uh, you know, 19 seasons with our company and, um, Plenty of young people who's, you know, I remember one a uh, wonderful Glencoe family, they had three kids. And every year, the mom would say to her, it's Mother's Day, so you have to come out and help plant the garden. Uh, so we would do that every year. And lo and behold, one of her sons in high school did his senior project at the Organic Gardener, then came back and worked for us, summer jobs during college. Um, last year, I think we had four Nutrier graduates on our staff. Um, this year we have two uh, girls who are in the IGS, the Independent Global Studies School program at Nutrier, which is so cool. And um, these two young women are studying invasive species and we have a woods full of them. So they're trying different things and they're out there with wheelbarrows, moving wood. And I'm um, a huge component of uh, as Maria Montessori said, you know, high school should include farming. <laughs> so uh, the IGS kids come out often for field trips. It's a lot of fun. But the reason that the heading on this is nature deficit disorder, that is a term coined by the wonderful author, Richard Louvre, who wrote Last Child in the Woods and other books. But the whole point is that not only children, but uh, us as well, that, that many human beings are suffering from not enough time in nature. Uh, and, and nature is such an important, um, essential part of who we are. And, uh, you know, the, we, we need to sort of air out our souls and, and get them out there in nature, or we, we just cannot thrive. And we see that more and more with our children um, you know, the un unfortunate epidemic of anxiety and depression. Um, in no way would I say that, you know, having a garden or a child being in a garden um, will, will ensure that they don't suffer uh, the woes of our current time on earth and that this generation of children is dealing with. But it is, it is a wonderful respite, uh, offset, um, you know, a place to go to um, immerse ourselves. My, my husband and I often talk about, you know, nature is our church. When we, when we go out to our, it's our favorite Sunday morning, we'll go out to our garden. There's no traffic, it's quiet, um, and really dig in. And not only are we digging in, you know, to put our plants in the ground, but um, we're digging in to ourselves, understanding ourselves, our place on the planet, what matters most to us. And, and gardening is such a beautiful time to reflect and connect. Um, so I, I, I love getting kids out there. Uh, climate change, uh, another topic that we're all trying to address and be better stewards of the earth. So on average, our food travels 1,200 miles via, or 50, 12 to 1,500 miles via fossil fuel to get to our plates here in Illinois. So when you grow your own food, you do a lot. It, it is a major uh, way for a family or an individual to reduce their carbon footprint. Uh, it's a bigger deal than we know. Uh, it really does uh, make quite a positive impact. Uh, and, you know, I, I often think about that I'm, I feel lucky, I get to talk about the good news. This is something we can do. <laughs> and it has just so many positive ripple effects in our communities and in our lives. Uh, oh, this is our, our garden in Lincoln Park Zoo. Um, and uh, the past few years with COVID, this has turned into a garden whose mission is to provide food for uh, in, food insecure Chicagoans. Um, and we grow over 2000 pounds of food in there. So um, it is a project that 
um, does uh, ask for donations through Green City Market. And anybody who is in the mood to support something like that, I have a little QR code over there where you can contribute um, to Green City Market to keep this program going, so the 19th season. So, um, and as I wrap it up, uh, lately, uh, there's a saying that I don't even know where I found it, but I love it. And it's when you plant, you grow. And uh, the reason I love it is because I've had that experience and I've seen so many people uh, experience that. We, we all are still growing <laughs> uh, and have our life lessons to learn. And learning them in a garden, planting is, is as far as I'm concerned, the place to be. So... Uh, that concludes the PowerPoint presentation, uh, but I know that there is a lot that I wasn't able to cover as far, you know, as details of growing a garden. So I'm happy to take questions if anybody has anything on their mind. Um, and if not, we can just chit chat. <laughs> yes. I have a lot of questions, but uh, maybe to begin with, we have a raised bed. We pinned it so long that we're gonna have to replace the wood. So I wanted to know, um, where do you get your soil and where do you get your wood for your raised bed? Yeah, so for the lumber, it's uh, important to use untreated wood. Right. We usually use cedar. Um, we have a wonderful relationship with um, a lumber yard in Glenview, standard lumber. So yeah. nice, standard, standard lumber, Eddie. Tell them I sent you. I think my husband, it, they talk every day. Is that on I don't know. Okay. Is it Lehigh, just north of yeah. okay, Very you. nice people. And you want to get the cedar. Um, as far as your soil, it really depends how much you're getting. Uh, if you're having someone deliver it or if you're just going to get bagged soil. Yeah. So, you know, if you're getting bags of compost, most likely. Um, you know, I think any of the garden centers, um, as long as you're getting straight compost, you know, leaf compost, or um, I, I think just about anywhere will do. Uh, we get a lot, I think they sell it bagged. I, I, I think it's, I don't know, it may be a bulk yard though, um, DK Organics in Lake Bluff. Reds would be a good spot. They're a nice company to you, support. DK used to sell bags of Oh, at Whole Foods. Yeah. Interesting. I do yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. Res is on Dundee. Mm hmm Yeah. And, uh, but you, you should just get compost. You, don't, you won't need topsoil. You can just add compost in. And then I do recommend getting a bag of organic natural fertilizer for the vegetable garden. There are several brands out there, Dr. Earth, a uh, few other brands. Uh, now you can go as far, and we do this for all of our gardens, of running a soil test and customizing the soil amendments you're adding. But it's also usually just fine to buy a, a pre-mixed um, organic gardening vegetable fertilizer. So I, I don't know if you want to answer three more questions, but where do you get your soil tested? Um, I'm going to have to tell you that via an email okay. that yeah, is something you know my extension okay is that yeah. where yeah. where you guys have been doing i i know we've yes, we're we've been, been you that, that's good we've been using another lab but you know we're sending in like 200 soil tests it's some kind of special it thing send you a little bag and okay. there you go but send email, right? yeah university of illinois I'm extension sure. yeah yeah no we used to do a lot of testing there yeah Just more quick. So yeah your control and now we're zone 6A. So I wanted to ask you about the deer best fence. Or right, so for deer, um, it's really about the height. So that can be anywhere between five, four and a half, and eight feet tall. Um, there is a product that, <laughs> that we like called uh, Benner, B E N N E R, Benner Deer Fencing. And it's, a, it's posts that are black metal and then a black wire mesh. 
and it's pretty easy to set up and it kind of disappears. You don't see it when you're about 20 feet away, but any type of fence can be made deer proof just by the height. Um, now, usually when you're, you're putting up a deer proof fence, you also want to make it rabbit proof. So you want to make sure that, you know, that bottom three feet are a tighter mesh for rabbits and, and a bit buried into the ground. Chipmunks sort of have their way with us, unfortunately. <laughs> what can we do? And then you mentioned, you know, our zone change. I think that's going to bring in bugs sooner. Yeah, I mean, definitely we're seeing, you know, the, the planting timing changing, also the season extending longer in the fall, um, and an increase of insect pressure for sure. Uh, we find ourselves more often using what's called a floating row cover. It's kind of a, a, a white fabric that is a physical barrier for the insects that we are having to use more often. But then but it's not really as much sun. Sun gets through that. Is that the acrobon you're talking about? Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, they make different weights and, you know, yeah, okay. for, for different purposes, but that is very helpful. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind where organic gardening, you know, some whole munch holes from an insect on the leaves of your plants are just fine. It's really when a plant's being decimated and you're not going to get a harvest, you know, that you want to do something. But expect some insect munching. That's okay. Any other questions from you? Those were good questions. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, so I'm interested in trying string trellising uh, mm -hmm. for my tomatoes this year. Mm -hmm. First try, any recommendations for that kind of system? Um, hmm. I, I like that type of system. Um, and, you know, you want to make sure that your, your posts are sturdy because it can get very heavy. And then a wind can come and it's kind of like a sail. Um, you know, when you, when you grow a tomato in a cage, all you have to do is sort of tuck it in to stay inside the cage. With the string trellising, you know, once a week or so, you want to be out there training, attaching. Um, but no, I've, I did that for years. I like growing tomatoes that way very much. And with your, with your support system, do you have like, like braces on it or? Well, it, there... ju it really depends. Okay. Um, but typically there is some type of bracing. Yes, we've often done it with like uh, T posts or U posts, you know, in a, in, a, in a row and then the string and then the, at the last one there'll be like a guide wire, you know, securing it down. Yeah, yeah. And you can also use that, you can grow your cucumbers on that string trellis, your uh, sugar snap peas, pole peas, pole beans. Uh, you know, if it's sturdy enough, a butternut squash, trellising is great. Vertical gardening. Yes, <laughs> other styles of trellis, but um, yeah. hopefully we'll see. Yeah, it's a fun part of it to yeah. experiment with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, Linda. Uh, yes, Jeannie. <laughs> um, for rec recommending um, as we stand at our seed part on Saturday, right. and we created these little directions for the seeds, right. some of the seeds, um, you know, recommending that you start inside. Okay, mm -hmm. so what particular soil, what particular starter, soil mm -hmm. starter? Mm -hmm. or if, if, what? You, if you get potting soil. Okay. Uh-huh. Um, and, so you know, there you are, if, if people care, I always get a, an organic potting soil. Right. With, you know, natural back guano and you know, uh -huh. good stuff in there. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, some of the directions, you know, said though a sort a starting mix, but that's still that is a so mix. Potting soil is that's a starting still mix. what that is. Yeah. Okay, that'll work well. Wonderful. Yeah. What are some of the mm -hmm. when you think of Glencoe, mm -hmm. um, and of course people are going to have what would be some of the best um, herbs to start mm -hmm. with and mm -hmm. vegetables. I mean, for us. We are starting with a lot that was donated, right? Seeds, and it'll be a learning year exactly. where we find out what people want. But yeah. if we had our choice, you know, mm. um, yeah, what would be well, some I think, of your I think, favorite? Uh, I'll tell you what we're doing. Maybe I should just tell you. Sure. You yeah. Say what you would add to it. But basil and 
um, arugula and beets and um, let's see, <laughs> thank you, chives, garlic, and um, the columbine that is native to here. Nice. And sunflower, because we got. That's um, great. So what would you recommend? Yeah, Should I we have added cilantro? Cilantro is nice. I mean, I think lettuce and spinach are very yeah, nice and easy, yeah. but you have arugula, so that's great. Uh -huh. Beans are wonderful, and those are especially great for growing, eating, and also saving right. seed. What so like some beans? plants are harder to save seeds, but uh -huh. be beans are the easiest. Well, okay. you could do a green bean, you know, Erico Vert, a, uh -huh. a slender French green bean, or, um, you know, it's fun to grow dried beans with kids, pinto beans. Okay. Because you know. um, we could maybe add on, but we're starting with a lot that was donated. Yeah, from a but I think that's company. great, you know, okay. because most likely, you know, people will get some of their seeds from the mm -hmm. seed library and then, you know, maybe go get some others. Right. So yeah. I think that's great. I have a question. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Getting back to their garden, let's say they have one more year of the raised beds. <clears throat> Can they do their own mulch once fall comes, like save all their leaves in, a, in an enclosure mm -hmm. and then the next year they'd be ready to go? Because that's what we did in Seattle. Yeah, but definitely. You, to, you you can you, you can compost you can make yeah. compost and add that to your garden. Absolutely. They could do that the fall, knowing that they're going to tear them down next year, mm -hmm. and then they have all that ready. And yeah, you fine. can. You and can. That's native. Mm -hmm. You can work. definitely. You know, okay. if you're making your own compost from your plant waste, your food scraps, leaves. Mm -hmm. um, then you can, you know, put that onto your soil. A lot of people do that. Mm -hmm. It's a fun process. And are, I, are you having a workshop on that? I was just going to say that. <laughs> in the first week of May, we're having a program, uh, sort of an informal drop-in program on how to compost. Great. And we also uh, are lucky to have Nina here from the Glencoe Community Garden. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a lot to learn there, um, you know, right, right along the Green Bay Trail. It's Glencoe's just yeah. so lucky to have the community garden, and there's you so can many. Come and garden with us anytime. Right, and and then you learn by doing, and there's so many knowledgeable mm -hmm. people there who really care. Um, so I wanted to bring up with the kids. Um, there's three things that happen, and number one, you can kids, you know, of course, they're so smart, but you can equate a plant to a human. And the point is that, mm -hmm. you know, even an animal, an animal can go without food but not water. A plant, right. And you need water and a plant, you know, and you totally. teach the survival. And the other thing we found is, you know, nature really uh, gives confidence. Mm -hmm. No matter how dirty, how bad, you know, there, yes. there's a point where they're not being compared to anything. Mm -hmm. It's... You know, it's their own experience. Yeah, and they're just, you know, and it's the ugliest fungus or the, you know, but the point is, is that there's no judging. And yeah. I think that's mm -hmm. so powerful for them. Mm -hmm. And they really do, when they see these fungus and the strain, you know, they're just cracking up. But mm -hmm. they told them, like a tree, you're different. Right. You know, but imagine no trees, you know, if we just had right. all of the same. And I just yeah. think it's really great for kids to, and even if you don't, do, you know, do any of this, you know, support a Boy Scout, you know, you just give $20 or there's scholarships mm -hmm. that you can give and to get these kids outdoors. Yeah. I think it's going to be very critical. It's very critical, I agree. Um, and so empowering to know how to grow your own food. Um, it really is an important skill and we don't want it to be a lost <laughs> art. <laughs> so that's. And can you teach me about Glencoe? Is this all like new, or you've been established? Because I just started with your trail. The oh, the Green Bay Trail. trail. So yeah. Have you been established for decades? Oh, or you mean Glencoe the community? Meaning the, oh. all your community gardening to the public. Uh, I don't know how old the community garden is, but, but Lena can speak to that. that. Yeah. We're on our thirteenth yeah. season. Here. So you're welcome to come and join us. You can go to our website and mm -hmm. when we what, we work three days a week when we're in season, and any, anybody's welcome. It's all voluntary. Okay. Yeah. Where is it located? It's right near Shelton Park on the Green Bay Trail, between the trail and the trade tracks. Okay. The harbor. 
And the, and the commitment to um, improving and maintaining the Green Bay Trail is many, many decades. Um, citizens have been involved. These are wonderful communities here where, you know, the whole community is sort of like a big botanic garden, really. And then, of course, we have the botanic gardens. A lot, a lot of gardeners here. Chicago Botanic Garden? Have, oh, over the years have done a lot there, a lot of teaching and collaborating and they have a wonderful program, Windy City Harvest, that's their urban farming. Are you involved um, in that at all? Or in, in, sort of? Yeah, I mean, you know, over the years we've done projects together, we've hired people through them, I'm, I have a close relationship with uh, colleagues, the women who started that program. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Jeannie, can you um, speak to some of the um, flowers that are good companion mm -hmm. um, plants mm -hmm. for our vegetables? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we use a lot of zinnias, mm -hmm. marigolds, sunflowers, salvia, nasturtium. Who else am I missing? What's that? Which you can, Which eat, you can eat as well. Those are some favorites. Uh -huh. Gomfrina, I like that flower a lot. Oh. It's a pretty one, isn't it? What did you say? It's called Gomfrina. I'm not sure I know. G-O-M-P-H-R-E-N-A. Mm -hmm. Looks very pretty with salvia. That's a nice combination. <laughs> All right, well. Do you use worm yeah. castings? We do use worm castings. We, and we make a compost tea from worm castings. That is an incredible fertilizer. Worm castings are fantastic, though. It's kind of a, a concentrate, compost concentrate. And do you put worms in your compost pile? And if so, what uh, genus? Yeah. Well, we're talking about in my husband's department. He orders the worms. But I do believe red wigglers may be what he orders. But yes, we like to put worms in the garden, worms in the compost. Worms are our friends. And worm castings are great. And, um, do you like them? Do you like the worm casting? Oh, yeah, I like all that stuff. I just don't have the space to do it. But, Got it. Um, as long as the bag says organic, it's okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't mean... I mean Pretty much. You know, I, mean, I like to read the ingredients on things. Um, but, you know, basically we're just looking for natural ingredients um, as opposed to and synthetic. I have a, star, a very small little patch. It might be six by eight. Mm -hmm. Is it would be advisable to take a couple of these bags and till them into the soil? Yeah, you could do worm castings or compost and work that in. I, I think annually it's nice to add, you know, one to five inches of compost, depending on, you know, how much soil you can bring your, in. What's your general turnaround time from the time you start composting to the time you can utilize it? So you can, year? no, I mean, you, you can work in your bag compost and plant that same day. Oh, really? Uh-huh, absolutely. If, it's, if it is um, completely broken down and looks like soil. You know, if you're adding something to your garden that's more rough, leaves or food scraps, put that in in the fall, then you're fine to plant in the spring. Yeah? Does the organic gardener support the clients, like, through the season, or do they just build yes. a garden? Yes. No, no, we do. We have... Uh, many families where we come every other week for sort of a gardening checkup teaching session. We have some families where we come once a week. Um, we have, you know, some clients who are uh, elderly and able to do some harvesting, but we do everything and we even harvest and they enjoy their gardens. So, um, it's so you'll, you'll go from, you know, bare minimum just building it all the way to like running it. That's right. Everything in between. That's right. I mean, we have six vans that are out every day with a crew in them, tending gardens. And so. if they're out there, they're, they're willing to teach you? Totally. They love to do that, you know. And um, Well, like this year, we have a client in Highland Park who's probably, we've worked with her, I would say, six seasons. And she said, you know what, I'm going to do it myself this year. Great. She's learned. She feels confident. And if next year she's traveling a lot, or you know, then we'll come back in and help, or, or we can just do part of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, we're all so busy, and 
having a vegetable garden is such a nice, it's like a little outdoor sanctuary. So mm -hmm. we help people make that doable mm -hmm. by, by doing some of the work. I, I'd say the bulk of the people that, uh, of our clients who are residential were there every other week. Mm -hmm. But certainly quite a few once a week. What about you support like people want to do fruit trees that mm -hmm. you sort of drag in in the winter? And yeah, we do. We do uh, like potted trees, yeah. mostly uh, citrus. Uh -huh. But we also, at our home in um, Northbrook, we have 12 or 16 fruit trees. We have an orchard. Mm -hmm. My husband and I were just pruning. <laughs> mm -hmm. The peaches do great. Uh, pears do great. Asian pears do very well here. Uh, they're my favorite. Um, apples, you know, other things like cherries or plums. It, it's touchier, yeah. you know. Yeah. But um, the peaches and the Asian pears and pears and apples do quite well. And then uh, raspberries do great. We grow, my favorite are the black raspberries, but we, we grow black, red, and gold raspberries. Mm -hmm. Um, blackberries, strawberries, um, blueberries are very difficult to grow here. And then we have some, some other interesting kinds of berries that I'm blanking on their name that my husband planted. They're, they're yummy. You know, there's kind of fun, sort of funkier things you can find in these catalogs. Um, it's not great fruit growing country here, but you can grow some. Where do you get your raspberry bushes from? Um, well, there's different, we order them online. Um, one of our favorite places is called Johnny's Selected Seeds, but I believe Stark Brothers is a great uh, supplier of fruit plants. Stark Brothers, um, I think that's where we get them mostly these and days. what kind do you say you get good results with? Because there are many different types of raspberries. Yeah. Um, you know, if we can, we'll grow s several several types, you know, a, an earlier bearing, a later bearing. They all do well. They really do. Um, and the black raspberries are thorny but delicious. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for just a couple more questions? Anyone has? I, I have one. Uh, I just read up on the uh, Cedar Point Farm and the kind of thing you know about bees, but uh, they were commenting source, but even if you have dandelions, mm -hmm. before it gets, it's a pollinator. Oh, absolutely. Don't, don't yes. cut them if you can't grow anything else. Right. But, but the other one was the water source, and it kept talking about a water source, and a lot of the um, gardens that I try to help with, I thought having the bird there, that isn't what they were talking about. Mm. They were saying just gently spray even if you have five minutes that the bees come to the leaves that mm -hmm. hold the water. Oh, and that's then, nice. Yeah, and, and right. so, and I'm like, I thought that, for me it was odd, because I'm like, well, they have the bird, but if it's constantly in use, the bees aren't going near mm. it, and you need another water source. That makes sense. They, they like the water yeah. on the leaves mm -hmm. in um, nature. Yeah. Yes. My dear friend is a beekeeper, and she sees her bees go to their pond because she has a pond mm. and so she watches yeah, them yeah so but, nice um, illinois we have what 200 and some different um, right um, native species of bees and that's what's so important um that we have these flowers absolutely yes. I mean, I may, excuse me, I may be wrong, but a lot. I think you're in the ballpark. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Well, I'll hang out a little bit. Um, if anyone wants to get a copy of my book or a card, um, we're, we're uh, getting a very early start this season and already building gardens. So uh, we're definitely looking to build more. I highly recommend the book. I read it several years ago, oh. and I loved it because not only was it so educational about gardening, but it's a love story. Yes. It I is. It's that. fine. But it was this great read because you learned a lot. It was this wonderful love story. It was so interesting. It was so personal. Thank you so much oh. for sharing it with us. Thank it's you. Great. Thank you, everybody. This is uplifting. <laughs> we all need an uplift.